Hey Beauty Church Tiger Boog Hills, thank you so much for joining us today. We are so excited to start our new series called Lead Like Jesus. So can I encourage you to take out your notebook and lean in as we prepare to receive God's word. I'm always glad to be in the house of God, worshiping the Lord with you. And I believe that we've got the best church on the planet. I'm just biased, but I just, I think tigers are just legit. And, uh, and we just want to say we're so glad that you came to church this morning. It's our absolute honor and privilege to serve you today, to serve you, to serve your family, to serve your kids. It's our greatest honor and privilege. And uh, I don't believe it's a coincidence you're here this morning. I'm, I'm convinced that God wants to speak to you today. And, and uh, Kelly made mention we're starting a brand new series called Lead Like Jesus. Uh, we just finished a series called Live Like Jesus. And after learning the tenets of faith, how to live like Jesus lived, now we're going to lead like Jesus led. And so I believe each one of us have influence, each one of us have a purpose, each one of us have a calling. And what we're going to do in this series is we are going to find out what that is. We're going to empower you to take your next step and we're going to see you win your world for Jesus. Take them, help you and your world take one step closer to heaven. And uh, and so I'm so excited about this series. In this series, you will receive more teaching from great leaders from around our city than in any other series we've ever done as a church. We've got some of the best leaders around our city. They're going to be joining us, speaking, guest speaking uh, with us for this next couple of weeks with the Lead Like Jesus series. Different messages morning and evening so you can double or even triple dip. Uh, there's one of our students that triple dips every Sunday and he's not even rostered on. He just loves being, I think it's the best thing ever. He's also single, so I'm just saying maybe that's why it's also, <laughs> I'm just throwing it out there. But um, uh, before we get into the Word, before we receive God's Word today and receive what He's prepared for us, I want to take a moment and just praise God. Like someone has to take a moment to thank God for what He's done. Last weekend was Easter. I'm not sure if you're aware. But last weekend was a pretty big weekend in the Christian calendar. And last weekend we saw just under 2,000 people receive the gospel. Oh, come on, Tigers. We can do better than that. Guys, that's a big deal. I don't know about you, but that's a big, big deal. It's a big deal. We are taking ground for the kingdom. It's never been about a church named View. It's always been about a Savior named Jesus. We give Him all the glory. He's the one doing the work. We just get to be a part of it. And I just want to praise God for allowing us to witness the great miracles that we did, that we'll continue to see overflow in Jesus' mighty and precious name. We're excited. If that's what God has done in the front end of the year, and we serve a God that goes from glory to glory, from strength to strength, I can't wait to see what's next in the life of our church, for our family, for your family, for your life. I believe God has the best ahead of you. While we're starting this new series, Lead Like Jesus, and I really believe that, that God wants to speak to you through this teaching today. The first service was phenomenal, but we know we second service, we take it to another level. That's just, that's just the warm-up anointing. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. But second service, I, I really believe that, that God's going to move in a mighty way. I also just want to say that, you know, I love our church, but I am more in love now with the church than I've ever been in my life. I am sold out, not just to our church, I'm sold out to the church, the church of Jesus Christ, the global church of Christ. I pray for the church. We help build the church. We help lead other churches and counsel other churches, and we, we're part of a wanting to restore our whole nation to serve the Lord. The reason why I love church is because it was in the church that I learned how to become a man. It was in the church that I learned how to treat women. It was in the church that I learned manners and to treat my elders with respect. It was in the church I learned how to build a family and build a marriage. It was in the church of Jesus Christ that I learned how to push through, dig deep, get strong, and use the strength that I have to fight for others who can't fight for themselves. It was in the church that I gave my heart to the Lord. It was in the church that He made me whole. It was in the church of Jesus Christ, not a church named View, the church of Jesus Christ that I came to find Jesus my Lord and Savior, and He made me new, He made me whole, He formed me. It was in the church. It was His bride. I believe the church is a holy, holy gathering of His saints. The church is filled with surrendered people, not perfect people. We surrender our life to the Lordship and leadership of Jesus. And we gather together in your faith and my faith and your joy and my joy. We come together and we work this thing life. We work it out and we, we bring heaven to earth in Jesus' name. This is why I love the church. We are formed for family. We are created for community. And I just want to honor you as we gather every single week as the church. You don't come to church. Sometimes we say that we come to church. No, no, no. We gather as the church. When you go back home, you're still the church. When you're at work, you're the church. And where the church is, where Jesus' name resides, I believe there's life, I believe there's freedom, I believe the kingdom is there in your workplace where you study because you are there and you carry the king. So I want to pray this morning 
into you know, this Lead Like Jesus series, that it wouldn't just be a series for somebody else. It would be a series for you. It would be a series for me that you would hear your Father's voice as we step into what He has prepared for us today. Come on, let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We honor you. We love you, Lord. And we just thank you that when you are present, darkness is absent. Thank you, Jesus, that the, the tomb is truly empty and the throne is really full. That means we can always have a hope no matter what we face. And I just lift every person before you right now and whatever season they're in, maybe they're feeling a bit lonely, God. Maybe they're feeling a bit overwhelmed or disappointed, deferred, anxious or worried. Whatever they're facing, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you speak life into their heart right now that you would speak courage into the spirit, Lord, that you would come alongside them, you would build them up with great friends, they would get planted, Lord, that add value to others, and they would continue to step in their God-given destiny, Lord. I pray that your hand be mightily upon them. As we receive your word, we open our hearts and minds in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, amen. Everyone say, lead like Jesus. Lead like Jesus. We just finished the series, Live Like Jesus, and now we're going to learn about how to lead like Jesus. And I believe that every single one of us have leadership on our lives. In a world that is consumed by trying to get more followers, I believe that we are desperate for better leaders. Come on now. Our schools need better leaders. Our country needs better leaders. Um, your workplace needs better leaders. The creative arts needs better leaders. The church needs better leaders. I've got a holy discontent with the best minds and the best leaders working for the world and not the kingdom. The world is desperate for better. And the world is consumed. With, get more followers. Actually, the kingdom is actually telling us to raise more leaders. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 18, when the leaders take the strain, people walk away blessed. When the leaders shoulder the weight of the problem, of the situation, of the circumstance, people are blessed. The reason why there's chaos is because there's a lack of leadership. Now, I want to tell you, leadership is spiritual and not secular. The world has said that leadership is secular, but leadership is actually spiritual. Quick survey while we're here all together. I'm glad that you guys came. Awesome. Looking good. Prachtach. Oman. Awesome. Amen. Good shirt. Come on, Man United. Amen. Sure. Division in the house over here. Quick survey. I want you to, not just a leader, if you're any kind of leader, I want you to raise your hand if you're a leader. Raise your hand. That's awesome. Take your hands down. There were a couple people, I just noticed, because I've got eyes and I can see, there were a couple people that didn't raise their hands. And the reason why you didn't raise your hand is not because you aren't a leader, it's because you think you're not a leader. Because leadership has been relegated to a position, to a title, to an authority, to a spot in the org chart. No, 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 but leadership is not a position. Leadership is influence. And leadership is spiritual. Back in the day, back, 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 way back in the day, I'm talking about just Adam by himself. I mean, that's a long time ago. God talks to Adam and he says, we're going to make man in, in our image. And he begins to speak to Adam. And he says, this is what I want you to do in Genesis 1:28. He says, I want you to rule over the earth, exercise authority and dominion over all living things. Now, Adam had not fallen yet, so he was in right standing with God. And what God did, he gave a spiritual mantle of leadership to Adam as God's child. Now, we are all God's creation, but you only become his child when you receive his son. You with me? So if Adam was the leader when he's in right standing with God to exercise dominion and leadership, and we are his children here today, who should be leading the world? It should be the children of God. Because we are the ones he's now given us I, I contend that Christians should be the greatest leaders on the planet. Christians should be the greatest leaders on the planet because we serve the greatest leader that has ever lived. Even if you look at a secular point of view of Jesus, if you have no faith in Christ as the Messiah at all, everyone who studied history would absolutely agree that Jesus single-handedly had the greatest impact of all humanity, of any human being that has ever lived, whether you have faith in him or not. He has impacted the world like no one else has ever impacted our planet, Jesus Christ. John Orberg says it like this. He says, well, if you were the betting or the gambling sort of people, of which we know that's the first service, not the second service, amen. I did also say that to the first service about the second, so I just want to transparent, you know, safe place, amen, amen, amen. If we, he reasoned that if we were the gambling sort and, and someone asked you, uh, who would have the greatest influence on history of the world? The Roman Empire, who had singular control and power of the known world, or a Jewish man with 12 inexperienced followers born in Bethlehem? Who would you put your money on? I tell us, 
we would have all put our money on Rome. But because Jesus was the greatest leader, born in obscurity, because he used the influence he had, he changed the world. We look at the Apostle Paul, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. As he began his teachings, as he wrote letters to the churches, much like our own, a local church, he began his first letter when he wrote it. He said, I am Paul, the apostle of God, called by Jesus. He said, the disciples added no value to my life. Pretty confident dude. Jeez, I must want to share it. I wouldn't say that. Second letter he wrote, I am Paul, a servant of Christ, here bringing the word, not with persuasive words, but in the demonstration of the Spirit. The next letter he wrote, he said, my name is Paul, the worst of sinners, so that the worst of sinners might be saved through my example. As Paul grew in authority, he actually grew in humility. The Christian leader does not grow up. Actually, the Christian leader, the next step up is a step down. For the kingdom of God is an upside-down kingdom. The world says that leadership is putting someone else up. The kingdom says, actually, it's not control, it's surrender that gains authority. You with me this morning? Christian leadership is all about servant leadership. You can't say Christian leadership other than servant leadership. That is the only kind of leadership that exists in our kingdom. We were born on earth, but we were designed in heaven. We are of another kingdom. We do things differently as Christians. And I believe because we have the greatest leader, we apprentice our life after his own. We lead like Jesus. We should be the greatest leaders on the face of the planet. And every single one of you, every one of you have influence. Not, don't add words to my sermon now. I know some of you, you think thinking everybody else has influence. No, no, no. Every single one of you have influence. If you're a parent, you have influence. You have great influence. If you're a spouse, you have great influence. If you're a teacher, you have great influence. Public servant, great influence. Marketplace, great influence. You have great influence. You know why? Because God's given you purpose. And your purpose is to help someone else take the next step towards heaven. You have a great purpose in life. You have influence. And influence is leadership. So every single one of us have been spiritually mandated as children of God to lead. We just need to change the way that we think about leadership. I think if you look at uh, Generation Z, that we, if we do studies of them, (laughs) that's about like like 20 letters below. (laughs) Anyway, jokes. The boomers. Love them. If If you look at Generation Z, it says that, well, studies show us, that they don't look at how people start their careers. They take a look at how people finish their lives. They actually take a look at what your life looks like and the fruits of your life. So I want to say this. If you're a bit older in age, you don't get to relegate and say, I don't get to lead. You don't get to retire from leadership. We need more people, more leaders finishing stronger. Because the next generation isn't looking how you start. They're looking how we finish. And so we need to, every season of life, God wants you to grow in influence wherever you are. If you're in your workplace, and I pray in Jesus' name, if someone's going through a tough time in their marriage, they'll be drawn to you like a magnet because you've got Zoe life in you. And they'll be like, hey, have you, what, what do you do when you don't know what to do? We say, I'll ask the one who does. Do you ask the one who does? Listen, we get together at my buddy's house midweek, and we, and we have some good food, and we discuss God's word. I don't know if you're a Christian, but... It, I know that view groups made my marriage better. I know that surrounding myself with healthy marriages has made my wife, I'm saying for myself, has made me a better husband, has made me a better dad. Well, if you want to join along, you guys are more than welcome. We've actually got a counseling team that doesn't just counsel people in our church. You don't have to be part of our church. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to be saved to join our, to be part of the, be, receive ministry from our counseling team. Hey, maybe we can connect the dots. Can you see how we're here to serve? How we're here to add value? And listen here, Christians, we're not just kind people for the sake of being kind. Romans 2 verse 4 says the kindness of God leads people to repentance. The reason why we're generous and kind and merciful is because we want to lead people to repentance, which means in right standing with God, every single one of us have influence. That means every single one of us have leadership. All of us should raise our hands and say, yes, I'm a leader because I got Jesus. You with me this morning? Leadership is influence and it's not secular. It's completely spiritual. As a child of God, I want you to receive this today. God wants to use you wherever you are at, in school, in work, in studies. He wants to use you to impact other people. So what we're going to talk about today is the heart of leadership. Each week we'll talk about a different aspect of leadership. Today we're going to talk about the heart of the Christian leader. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 says, Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it, not to it, from it. So if you want to take a look at what your future looks like, take a look at your heart today. Another translation says, God, your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. 
James Cleary, he wrote the book called Atomic Habits. He says, why is far better than what? Simon Sinek wrote the book, uh, Start With Why. He says, average leaders teach people what to do. He says, better leaders teach people how to do it. He said, the greatest leaders teach people why they do it. What we're going to do now is we're going to study a portion of Scripture, and Jesus is going to help his disciples get to why we do what we do. We're going to get to the heart of Christian leadership because everything flows from it. So we can't teach more about leadership unless we get the heart right. You with me? So what we're going to do is we're going to do a heart transplant today. You didn't even know that you guys are getting a heart transplant today. Well, this is what's happening. We're getting a leadership heart transplant because we're going to change our hearts so that we can change what happens in our future. So we're in Matthew chapter 20. You can turn to your Bibles there. Or if you've got a Christian close to you, you can open up there. Um, you like that one? It's not a bad one, huh? Yeah, it's not a bad one. Or you can take a look at the screens. Matthew chapter 20 from verse 20. It says, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons, she doesn't, you don't even mention the sons' names because she's that embarrassed. No, I'm joking. But maybe. The mother of Zebedee's sons, that means they're in trouble. This is your son. This is your daughter. Anyone else ever say that? No? That's your son that did that. Not my daughter. No, yeah. The mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, kneeling down and asked a favor of him. In other words, they brought mommy to the conversation. They said, they were squabbling, and she said, stop squabbling, because they were squabbling, who's the greatest in the kingdom? Who's, who's going to be the best in the kingdom? Who's the most awesome disciple in the kingdom? They're squabbling, and mom said, stop fighting, I'll go there. I'll, you, you think I won't? You think I won't take you there? I'll take you there. You think, I, you think I'm not going to take you? Come on. And brought it's James and John along to Jesus, and said, hi, Jesus. So, so sorry to bother you. I know you're busy, you've got saving the whole world. You know, you know, the son, all these things, kneeling down. You thought I was, not I told you I was. I told you. Sorry, Lord. Anyway, as I was saying, Jesus asked the mother, said, what is it that you want? He asked. She, she said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. They were still under the premise that Jesus was going to dethrone the Romans, that he was going to enthrone himself, that he was going to have a physical kingdom now, and what they wanted to see, who's going to be the left and the right of him? Who's going to be higher on the org chart at the end of the day, because whoever's at the highest of the org chart gets the most rewards? Jesus sees what's happening here, and he says, well, he says, you don't know what you're asking. Jesus said to them, can you drink the cup I'm about to drink? Another translation is, can you drink the cup of suffering I'm about to drink from? We can, they said. Good, no, they haven't seen, they haven't seen passion. They haven't seen the passion yet. They didn't watch that movie. He says, you don't want to ask me. He said, we can. Jesus said to them, you will, need, you will indeed drink from my cup. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by the Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers, only because they didn't ask. That's why they were so upset. These two brothers asked before them. Oh, man, now we missed out. But what Jesus recognized straight away is that they were focusing on the position of leadership, and he needs to teach about the heart of leadership. They thought that, okay, if we're going to be great leaders in your kingdom, we need to push ourselves up. But Jesus is about to teach them how the kingdom actually works. From verse 25, he says, then Jesus called the disciples together. They're going to have a leadership conference now. They said, whoa, 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 whoa. we're going to stop the bus right now. Leadership conference. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. This, this phrase, lorded over, or exercise authority, is the word kata, which means to push down so that you can come up. He says, you know the world leads like this. They push everyone else down so I can get up. Everyone else gets lower so I can get higher. Everyone looks bad so I can look good. Everyone gets pushed away so I can get closer. Come on now, anyone else? He says that's how the world exercises their leadership. Four words that we are about to, I pray it strikes you right in the heart, but he says this, but not so with you. He's talking to believers. He's talking to Christians. This is not how we lead in the kingdom of God. Yes, you're on earth, but you're actually a citizen of heaven. We lead differently because we are different. We are of the world, but not in the world. In the world, but not of the world. That's the way. Don't write that first one down. Correct it. Get your theology right. Come on now. We are from a different world. We are from the upside down kingdom. He says this, continues to teach him, not so with you. Instead of pushing everyone down like the world does, to push themselves up like everyone else does, instead of that, whoever wants to become great among you must be a servant. And whoever wants to be first 
must be a slave. A servant puts others before themselves, and a slave says yes and amen to the master's commands. Say, so just as the Son of Man came from the highest place, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Instead of pushing everyone down and pushing yourself up, he said, you need to be like the Son of Man who came from the highest place and actually made himself the lowest. If you really want to be great in this kingdom, if you want to be, you have to be lost. You have to be the servant and slave to all. You, you have to give your life as a ransom, a sacrifice for many. Jesus is a, attacking their heart right now. They want to position, but actually true leadership is influence, and it starts with their heart. He's saying, in this kingdom, we serve to go up. We go down to go up. In the kingdom of heaven, we put value on other people because God is my promoter. If you have to fight to get there, you have to fight to stay there. But if God promotes you, he will keep you there in Jesus' name. Say amen. Our leadership is not about climbing the chart higher. Our lead for our reward. Patrick Lesioni says this. He says there's two motives for, uh, for leadership. You're either reward-centered or responsibility-centered. There's two motivations. Either you say yes because you see there's a reward or you say yes because I want to say yes to responsibility. As Christians, we aren't reward-centered. I don't say yes to leadership because there's no more people serving me. I say yes to leadership because I get to serve more of others. I say yes to leadership because it's not a reward, it's a responsibility. There's a reason why they call it bleedership. Because you will bleed in leadership. But Exodus 18 tells us when the leaders take the strain, people walk away blessed. You know why there's a lack of blessing in our nation? Because we need better leaders. And I'm not talking about in the cabinet, I'm talking about in the church. I'm talking about Christians doing what we can where we are leading people to the kingdom of heaven, bringing heaven to earth and taking earth to the kingdom. You with me? This is why each one of us need to, have to. It's, it's fundamental. You have to. This is, you have to understand that you are called to leadership and then step in with a bigger jacket. It's not a title. It's not a position. It's a place of influence. It's a revelation. It's a spiritual mantle. At the end of the service, I'm going to pray three prayers. I'm going to pray for a spirit of leadership. What, what happened was when Moses was handing over to Joshua, he laid hands on him and anointed him. He took oil and put oil on his head and put his hands on him. And what that represented was an anointing. An anointing, what is an anointing? I'm so glad you asked. Good question. An anointing is a divine enablement. In other words, it's a supernatural impartation for you to do something you cannot do with your own skills or strength. And he said, I pray for a spirit of leadership to come upon Joshua to lead these people into the promised land. Did you know that other people will depend on whether or not you say yes or no to being a leader wherever you are? Not the position, the place of influence. Servant Christian leadership will lead people to the kingdom of heaven. And other people are depending whether or not you'll say yes to putting on a bigger jacket. It's a big responsibility. I believe one day when we get to heaven, when the highlight reel comes up and we went through the great white throne and now we have the beam of seats of Christ, there's, there's two thrones. The first one sorts one from the other. The other one is reward ceremony. For Christians, we, we, we get the reward ceremony. And you'll take a look at your life and you'll say, hey, I just want to take a look at what you did. These are the awesome rewards that you will receive now. It's awesome. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> so there we go. Amen. That's the one of the receipts. It's going to be here. Yeah. Um, but one of the things they're going to ask you, what did you do with what I gave you? Well, you didn't give me much. Well, actually, I gave you a lot. I gave you 73 years, 75 years. I gave you 80 years. I gave you 60 years. I gave you, I gave you 40. I gave you 30. I gave you, I gave you influence. I gave you resource. I gave you those neighbors in your street. But not once did you knock on their door. I gave you influence with the kids that you teach, with the colleagues that you work with. I gave you opportunity after opportunity to lay hands, to pray behind their back. What did you do with what I gave you? And we're going to have to give an account for that. I believe you are leaders. I believe that we are called to lead our nation. The best leaders should be Christians because we follow the greatest leader ever. He's saying, but in this kingdom, it's not about you pulling yourself up. It's about you coming down and the Lord lifting you up. If you're too big to serve, you're too small to lead. That's just the truth of the kingdom. We need to serve. And I'm not just talking about serving on team. You know what? Jesus served the temple. You know why we talk about growth track and next steps? Not because we need more hands. It's because Jesus served the temple. You know why we talk about small groups and few groups? Not because we want more people in circles. No, because Jesus is part of a small group. We are Christians, little Christ. We follow your prince of life after Jesus. You know why we take care of the poor? Not because we are humanitarian aid, because Jesus took care of the poor. You know why we take care of the widow and those who are hurting and those who need prayer and those who need laying hands and those things who need deliverance and freedom? You know why we do all the things? Because Jesus did all the things. So we're going to live like Jesus. And then church, listen to me, we're going to lead like Jesus in Jesus' name.
and give him all the glory. We're going to lead more and more and more and more and more people to Jesus with whatever influence we have. We say, Lord, I'm, going to use, I'm not going to waste today. Church, listen to me. The enemy would love you to exclude yourself from this conversation. He would love for you just to relegate yourself to everyone else as influence except for me. I've got nothing. What can I, you, know, I, you know, I'm in the back. No, 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 no. If you have the Spirit of God, if you've got the Son, God's called you, given you dominion to bring influence to wherever you are. At church, at home, at school, you have influence is leadership, and God is asking you to use what you have to bring Him glory for the sake of others. If you want to be first, the Bible says you need to be last. So we're going to pray. We're going to pray three prayers, and then we're going to break bread together so the team can come up. And as they do, my question is this. So if leadership is for the Christian, if leadership is influencing others and helping others and serving others, Christian leadership, and we understand that now, now why, why don't we lead? Why don't more people lead? Why don't more people add value? Why don't, people, why, why, why don't, we, why don't we see ourselves as leaders? Well, I think it's two reasons. The core reason is fear, but it's the fear of failure and the fear of man. We fear that we're going to fail so we don't put the jacket on. We don't take the next step. We don't say, well, maybe God can use me because we know me, but God knows you too, and he still calls you, and he doesn't call the equipped, he equips the call, that's not just a cool saying, that is absolutely the truth, he doesn't want you able, he just wants you willing, if you're willing, God makes you able, say amen, on the other side of you, yes, I heard a testimony from the first service, before this first service about a young girl, she's awesome, uh, she's studying medicine, and she was doing her comm serve out in uh, Beaufort West, and they have to adopt a project or create a project to help the community move forward. While well, she decided to partner with a local church to help people who were uh, struggling, who are struggling with substance abuse. From children, said some children as young as seven years old are addicted to alcohol, 11 years old is addicted to heroin, all the way up to the 40s and 50s. She says the whole spectrum of that. And what she, what she had to do was for that week or so, you need to have a project where you can help alleviate some of the pain and some of the things that they medically can help with. Well, she didn't want the work to end. So she partnered with some churches, they got together, she was able to be part of one meeting, she's back home now studying in Tigerberg, she's part of our church, but the meetings haven't stopped happening. They've now taken what they've started, they've gone to schools, they've invited other people to be part of the program, they've now linked other churches. Imagine if she said, and listen, she's an introvert, she'll never get on stage, that's why I don't mention her name, she's, she's an introvert. Imagine she didn't give God her yes. Imagine, now Beaufort West, Let's imagine what it could be like in five years' time if they keep this trajectory. It's only been three weeks. They're already going to schools and getting churches together. Because a, a person just said, well, well, this is what I can do. I, I, I can say yes to this. I, I can't say yes to forever, but in a week, maybe I can start. And then what God can do with your yes is absolutely supernatural. I don't want you to withhold your yes. Don't hold back that next step. Don't hold back what God is asking you to be. If He's asking you to be on team, be on team. If he's asking you to be baptized, be baptized. If he's asking you to serve someone uh, at your workplace, serve someone at your workplace. Add value. You have influence and leadership. Give God your yes. Proverbs 29 verse 25 says this, The fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. You know what the enemy says? Don't have a go because you're going to hurt yourself. Actually, the Bible says that if you fear man more than you do, missing out on the will of God, that's an unsafe trap for your life. But if actually you want to stay safe, that's when you fear the Lord and you step into what He's called you to do. Not a, not a scared fear. No, there's a reverent awe. Wow, my Lord is inviting me to be a part of what He wants to do. I'm just going to say yes with whatever I have and little is much in the hands of God. It's a hard thing. As Christians, we're here to serve. We're here to add value. The higher we go, the lower we go. We say yes to responsibility, yes to not only caring for myself, but helping someone else take their next step. This is the Christian call to leadership. This is how Jesus lived his life. This is how Jesus led his life. And he's inviting you right now to be a part of that. So we're going to pray for three things. We're going to pray for a spirit of leadership, an anointing, a divine impartation for every single one of us. We're going to pray that. And you're going to say yes and amen. So yes, Lord, I believe I have influence. I believe that you want to use me. I believe I can help someone else take a step closer to you as I serve you and as I serve them. I'm a servant, and Lord, I'm a slave. I'm saying yes and amen to what you're asking me to do. 
that we're going to pray that God would open up your spiritual eyes and ears. It's going to impart something in your life that, wow, maybe God can use me. He can use me wherever I'm at. And then we're going to pray. I really felt this. We're going to pray for physical healing. We still believe God heals. We still believe God sets free. We still believe God brings alignment. And there's some specific prayers. And our prayer cards that we're praying over this week, there was just a lot of prayers for healing. And so I want to speak into that space. I want to pray in healing. I'm going to use all our faith. We're going to activate all our faith. And we're going to pray with faith in Jesus' name for healing. I believe God can restore. He will do it in Jesus' name. We're going to trust God. We're going to say amen. We're never going to stop knocking for healing. You know, we're never going to stop asking for healing. We're going to put it in God's hands. Our loving, kind, benevolent Father say, Lord, we're going to take the situation and put it in your hands. And tomorrow, I'm going to put it in your hands. And the next day, I'm going to put it in your hands. I'm, you know what? My hands can't do much, but your hands can do a lot. So then we're going to pray for physical healing. And then we're going to pray for salvation. I'm going to invite you in that if you don't know the Lord and Savior, we saw many salvations in the first service. If you don't know Jesus personally as your Lord and Savior for yourself, you're going to surrender your heart to the Lord. This is your opportunity. And then what we're going to do is we're going to break bread together. Then we're going to worship the Lord together. We're going to end up with a song of praise. And we're going to step into this week knowing that we're going to lead like Jesus. So come on, let's stand to our feet this morning. I believe the word of the Lord has been preached. God has shared his heart with you today. But what we're going to do now is we're going to receive. We're going to receive this prayer. I am not the one with authority this morning. Jesus is going to anoint you. He is going to fill you. Jesus is going to touch you. Jesus is going to shift something within you. You never, you always thought it was for somebody else. Today, you're going to realize, no, Jesus has been talking to me. You've always said influence for everyone else. No, Jesus wants to use you. You are placed for a purpose. You might be confused as to why you are, where you are, how you are, but God is absolutely convinced that he's placed you for a purpose. You need to say yes to that purpose. Joshua, a young man, he, he didn't, with a big, big assignment, it wasn't because he was so skillful that he was able to lead his people into the promised land. No, no, no. The reason why is because he received an anointing. He said, yes, God, this is your plan for my life. And I'm just going to say yes. With the next step, be a good steward and say yes again. And then say yes again. And then say yes again. And little is much on the hands of God. So I don't know about you, but when I'm about to receive something, I open up my hands. I smile and I peek. But I want to encourage you to open up your hands, open up your heart right now. I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to pray that Jesus would anoint us by the power of the Holy Spirit for a spirit of leadership, of influence over the world that we find ourselves in to lead your world towards the King. So Jesus, I lift every single person before you right now. In Jesus' name, I just want to take captive any negative thoughts, any thoughts of doubt, any thoughts of of negativity, God, any stronghold, a well-defended lie from the enemy that says that you can't use them, that they aren't worthy, that they don't have influence. We take all those thoughts right now captive. We identify them as lies, and then we replace it with the truth. The truth is, God, we believe that you've placed us for a purpose. And right now, we pray that you would anoint us from the throne room of heaven. Anoint us to be the leaders you're calling us to be, to serve people, to love people, to add value to others, to, to be the least, to be the last, so that they can step into the most, God. They may come to know the most high King of kings and Lord of lords. We're saying, yes, you have a purpose for our life. I pray that when we leave this place, Jesus, you will continue to walk to that purpose with your Holy Spirit, with your word, with your people that we will continue to run and know that you've called us to change others. We are changed lives, changing lives. We receive this by faith in Jesus' name. Now, church, I want you to activate your faith. We prayed and we received now and we're going to petition for ourselves. Maybe you need personal healing. I want you to lift that to the Lord. But I also want you to intercede on behalf of somebody else. These are some of the things that I came across this week. We're praying for someone who's fighting stage four cancer. We're praying for someone who's fighting a brain tumor. We, we fight, we, we're praying with someone who needs a, a bypass, a heart bypass. Someone who's going for a double mastectomy this week. Someone who's struggling with MS. Someone who needs emotional healing from a divorce. Devastated from broken relationships. We're praying for someone who's going for a biopsy for breast cancer. We're praying for all these things. We believe in the mighty name of Jesus that God is able to heal. He's able to restore. And it's not in spite of us praying, it's because we're going to pray. We're going to petition all of heaven right now. We're going to keep knocking. As a church, we don't stop knocking. We say, Jesus, we ask for healing. We ask for breakthrough. We ask for provision. We ask for your touch. We ask for your will. We ask for your providence. And we keep on knocking in agreements as a church. And the Bible says there's power in agreements. So right now, maybe it's you, maybe it's friends that you can think of. 
I want you to picture them in your mind. Even as I've listed all those things, maybe that's you here today. And we're going to stand in agreement for healing. Don't just listen to me pray. Please, church, I'm asking you to plead for heaven's cultures and realities to come down to earth right now. In Jesus' mighty name, we bring before you every person, Lord, that needs a touch from heaven. We're about to break bread, which is a revelation that because your body was broken, we can be made whole. And so, Lord, we believe in healing. We believe in restoration. We believe in alignment. So we speak to the cancer and we curse it in Jesus' name. We speak to the ailment. We speak against diabetes. We speak against heart disease. We speak against pulmonary uh, a disease, God, disease of the lungs. We speak against any disease of the body. In Jesus' name, Psalm 103 says, for Get not all the benefits of serving the Lord. The one who forgives all your sin is able to heal all your disease. And so, Lord, as your people, we're never going to stop asking you and placing these things in your hands. Heal our land. Heal our people. Heal your children. Hear our cry, God. With all our faith combined, we pray in Jesus' name that you would right the things that are wrong, that you would, that you would alleviate the pain that God, and at the end of the day, when you do, God, when you do, whether this side or that side of eternity, when you bring healing, we would say, Jehovah Rapha was my healer. Maybe you used medicine, maybe you used prayer, but it was only God that brought the healing. So we love you, Lord, and we commit all these things into your hands in Jesus' name. Now we're going to talk about eternal healing. In this attitude of prayer, in this place of worship, I want to invite you. The Father is inviting you here today to surrender your life to Him. There's a difference between commitment and surrender. What He's asking is you to make a commitment to surrender. Surrender your life, lay your life down to pick up His own, to step into what He has for you. If that's you here this morning with every eye closed and head bowed, you're saying, Dino, you're talking to me. Today is the day that I'm surrendering my life to you. Christians, I want you to intercede and pray now. You're saying, Dino, that's me. I'm making a decision for myself. Today is the day that I'm surrendering it all. I'm handing my life over to the Lord. I can't do it on my own anymore. Jesus, I need you to be my leader, my savior, and my king. And so I'm asking you, Lord, to be my, to save me right now, to forgive me of my sin, to wash me clean and make me new. If that's you, you're saying, Dino, that's me, then I want you to raise your hand right now. Say, Dino, include me in that prayer. I'm giving my heart to the Lord. That's awesome. That's awesome. I see those hands. I see those hands. I see those hands. That's awesome. Anyone else here this morning? You're saying, that's me. Do you know, I'm giving my heart to Jesus. Today's the day. This morning's the morning. This moment is the moment. I'm giving my heart to the Lord. Shoot your hand up. Say, that's me. That's awesome. I'm giving my heart to Jesus. I see that hand over there. That's awesome. That's great. Thank you, Jesus. Welcome to the family. We give you honor. We give you glory, Lord. You're saving us. You're changing us. You're not making us better. You're about to make us brand new. Then as a church and as a family, we're going to pray from front to back, from side to side by faith that old things are about to be made new, that He's about to resurrect you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, not because of your good works, but because of His good grace. So come on, church, pray with me as we declare God's goodness. Father God, come on, Father God, I thank you for sending your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for my sins. I confess I'm a sinner I need forgiveness and I ask you now forgive me Lord wash me clean and make me new and by faith I declare I'm a new creation the old is gone and the new has come I promise to worship you and serve you all the days of my life in Jesus mighty name and all God's people said Amen, amen. Come on, we can celebrate with some people today. Amazing, amazing, amazing. We still have one more thing to do as we close off the service. Then we'll end up with a song of praise. We're going to break bread together. So you can grab those emblems. Right now, I'm going to ask Kelly to pass me one there. We can grab those emblems. The reason why we do this is because of the prayer we just prayed. That our confidence, the only way we get to heaven is not the absence of sin. It's the presence of Christ. And the bread, what we just prayed for healing, represents His body that was broken for you and me, that we can believe God for healing. Even if we can't see it, even if we can't feel it, we can believe God that He will heal us. And when it's all said and done, we will receive healing in Jesus' name. And the juice represents the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of sin, that I can run to my Father, not from my Father when I'm in trouble. 
Every day I can always come to his throne room. Because the cross's work is finished, I can always rest in his finished work. So we are going to, if you need some help, you can push it up, then you push it down. And then with the first form, as you take that off, that's the bread. We're going to receive the bread together today. And we're going to say yes and amen to his healing. Thank you, Lord. This represents your body that was broken for our healing. We thank you for, for this, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. What a great day to be in church. What a great day to be in his presence. What a good day to be worshiping the king. This juice represents your blood, Lord. It's of the new covenant. We're drinking of the new cup that you set in place with the finished work. Thank you, Lord, that this represents the forgiveness of sin. You've made us new. You've washed us clean. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name. If you gave your heart to the Lord, we've got a wonderful ministry team after we finish our song of praise. We would love to pray with you. You can come to the front afterwards. It's private. We'd love to pray with you, give you the free gift of God's word. Just amazing. Well, church, we hope that message encourages you. We would love to see you in person at our services on a Sunday morning at 8.45, 10.15 or 5 p.m. If you'd like more information, please visit our website at tigerberghills.church.